All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and welcome to this next installment of the Inner Source Health webinar series. I'm Dr. Robert Kochko, and I'm excited to have Dr. Victoria Leota um, back with us today, talking all things acupuncture. And I know we get lots of questions about the language that we use with acupuncture, and sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. And Dr. Leota is our specialist. Um, in this realm at Intersource Health. So she's the perfect person to try to help clarify some of these things. So um, thank you for joining us live. And if you're listening to this as a recording afterward, um, we're always available to you. Um, any follow-up questions, certainly save till the end. Um, and so I just wanted to read a little bit of an introduction for Dr. Leota. Victoria Leota is a doctor of acupuncture and a New York State licensed massage therapist. She holds a BA from Villanova University prior to earning her doctorate in acupuncture from Pacific College of Chinese Medicine. Dr. Leota's goal as a healthcare practitioner is to utilize her knowledge to help those with challenging health conditions, but her philosophy is simple. Take care of yourself now. She considers herself a general practitioner of acupuncture. However, most of her patients present with pain of the body, limbs, or head. Dr. Leota also has experience in the specialty of psychological and emotional health, frequently helping those with anxiety. Patients respond well to her attentive demeanor, knowledge, and technical expertise in acupuncture. So without further ado, thank you, Dr. Victoria Leota, and you can take it away. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Rob, for the uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Victoria Leota, and uh, as Rob said, I'm a doctor of acupuncture and a licensed massage therapist. And I want to talk to you all today about acupuncture, as I find it so interesting. And when I speak to patients uh, during a treatment or after or before a treatment, they always tell me, tell me more. I find this fascinating. So I'm going to go over just some basic terms um, that you might hear and how they were, are applied with acupuncture and even a few uh, tools of the trade and some adjunct uh, treatments that we use. So let's get started. I uh, wanted to show this cartoon to start just to break the ice a little bit because I found it so funny because this is the way I felt when I first got acupuncture, not necessarily like a woolly mammoth, but I felt that why are they putting needles or why are they doing acupuncture on my feet if I have a headache? It didn't make sense to me. And I know many people wonder that when I uh, start doing acupuncture on someone, they say, no, 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 it's in, it's in my arm. The, the pain's in my arm. And if you look closely, you see the cavemen putting spears, throwing spears into the uh, legs and the buttocks of this woolly mammoth. And he's wondering the same thing. Why is my neck suddenly feeling better? So I'm gonna explain that in a minute with some terms, but just keep this in mind, okay? So let's start at the beginning with yin and yang. Um, this is the basic of acupuncture in Chinese medicine because back many years ago, thousands of years ago, the ancient Chinese, um, they were trying to figure out how the world worked. How does uh, the body heal itself? How does it get ill? How could we help the body? And um, they started with nature. They looked outside and they used their own eyes and their senses to describe things. How, first of all, with yin and yang, how the world uh, operated. And they saw that half the day was bright, sunshine. The other half was dark. They assigned the night or the darkness to the word yin. They called it yin. And they described it as being, you know, cold. They assigned that aspect to yin because at night it tends to be colder and darker and more static. There was less activity. And they also, uh, they said the things that are more solid uh, and less active, of course, are yin also. And if you look at the picture to the right, you'll see that the darker, portion is the yin, while the brighter is the yang. Now the yang was assigned to the daytime where it was bright, more active, animals are awake, going about building their nests, doing th different things, people are working, children are playing. So there's more activity during the day. And they also said, well, we'll assign the warmth or heat 
to yang. We'll say that's a yang aspect because it's warmer during the day. And they also, and this will make sense in a moment when I talk about the organs, uh, said things that are hollow tend to be more yang, okay? And it's always comparative, comparative and they work together, the yin and yang. Now they also, and when I say they, I mean the ancient Chinese, looked at the body and they sensed there was something going on that was keeping us alive. Some kind of, what's, what's keeping us vital? What's, what's keeping us going during the day to keep our organs going, to keep us breathing when we're sleeping and, and whatnot. And they sensed that there were meridians in the body, almost like the circulatory system or the nervous system. But you could think of the meridians as like rivers in the body. And if you look at this picture to the right, you'll see that there are lines going through the torso, through the face. There are also uh, lines which represent the meridians on the back, on the limbs, all over the body, and they circulate energy. And you've probably heard the word qi before. We use qi every day as practitioners of Chinese medicine and acupuncture, and that means energy. You've probably heard that before. Now, the meridians are all names for an organ. And uh, the organs of Chinese medicine, the major organs are, the, you know, some of them are the liver, the spleen, stomach, large intestine, and so forth. So there, you would have an, uh, a meridian called the lung meridian, the lung channel, okay? And that carries the energy of the lung. And it's named that because it does pass through the organ, even though the lung channel is on the arm. Um, or you might have the same thing, you know, you could say the same thing about the stomach channel, which is on the leg and goes through the torso and up to the head. It does go pass through the organ that it's named for. So the stomach channel, although much of it is on the leg, as I said, and the face and the, you know, other places, it does go through the stomach. And all these, the takeaway is all these meridians are there to distribute chi, okay, or energy. Now, along these meridians, are points, the acupuncture points, where we do the acupuncture. You could also do acupressure at these points. And um, they're all found along the meridians, although some, we have special points that aren't on meridians, uh, but most of them are found on a meridian and it's where the chi tends to gather, it's more concentrated. Now, what's interesting is the points all have different functions. Some are local, meaning to the area where the point is. So if you look at this picture here, you see a red dot. That is in a spot that's a very popular uh, acupuncture point used often almost with every patient in my case. Uh, it's on the large intestine channel and it's the fourth point on the large intestine channel. So we call it large intestine four. That's just the sidebar. It's known as for many, to, to many people as the headache point where we uh, press, uh, you do acupressure on it, you could do acupuncture on it, and it tends to relieve headache pain. Now that's considered its distal function. Okay, like I said, why are we using, uh, you know, acupuncture on the hand when I got a headache? Well, it's because the, um, the point is found on a meridian channel which travels up the arm and eventually terminates in the face area and the head area, um, like, like many uh, acupuncture meridians do. This point in particular has a distal function of clearing and, and treating the energy of the face. It's known as the face, the, the command point of the face. So it has um, you know, du dual functions. It also clears heat. Sometimes you have a throbbing headache, which you feel like your head's you know, very hot. It could clear heat. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say, and I'm getting off, uh, uh, getting a little involved here, uh, is that points have local functions, meaning they could help treat the local area, like in this case, the hand, the fingers, even the wrist, or they could treat an area away from the site of pain. So if we go back to the woolly mammoth, you could see they're throwing spears into his legs and whatnot, but he's feeling better in the neck. So that's kind of the idea. I hope that makes sense to people. I tried to explain it as easy as I could, but basically we have points, you know, each point has a local function where it's placed, where, and they have a, a distal, they usually have a distal function someplace other than uh, the area where the point is that it could help out and heal. The sun, or sometimes people say chun, is a unit for measurement, it's a basic unit for measurement that we use in acupuncture. 
And it really is just pretty much a thumb width, like over near the knuckle of the thumb. And it's purport, we use this because we have to be thinking proportion proportionate to the patient when we do acupuncture. So I don't take out a ruler and measure, you know, a few inches to find a point on someone's arm. I would say, okay, I use a landmark, which could be a wrist crease, an elbow crease. It could be a, a bony landmark like the elbow. And I would describe it as, let's say, three sun or thumb widths from the wrist crease to find a point, one point in particular. Um, I don't necessarily count out in the person's thumbs, but I usually have an idea of their proportions by their thumb size and, on the, uh, and, and other uh, bony landmarks and uh, markings on the body. Um, I found it interesting. I was talking to my hairdresser a few weeks ago, and she said that hairdressers use markings on uh, the face in particular, the eyebrows, the eyes when they're doing a haircut. And I was like, oh, that's, you know, basically how we do acupuncture and find where to uh, place the needles when doing a treatment. We use markings and measurements. But the uh, basic measurement is a sun, which is like a, represents a thumb, basically. Moo points and shoe points. Okay, these are specialty kind of points. Um, I put this here because many times when I'm doing an acupuncture treatment, I'll say to a patient, um, oh, you know, why don't you turn over? I'll do some shoe points on you, okay? I'll treat you with the back shoe points and they call them back shoe points also. And uh, looking on the right side of the screen, uh, you can see the location is on either side of the spine. And just to get back to the suns, it's actually, one and a half sun from the midline where the spine is on the back. You would measure out, you know, about one and a half sun. As an acupuncturist with training, I know how to visualize that on a person. Also, I can use the high points of the paraspinal muscles, if you're familiar with the musculature of the back tip. <laughs> but um, each organ has a shoe point. Okay, so going back to the organs, not only do they have channels, but they have shoe points which are found in the back. So there's liver shoe point, spleen shoe point, kidney, and, and whatnot. And back shoe points are usually used to treat the back for any kind of discomfort or pain. That would be their, I guess, local function, you would say. Or they could treat the more solid organs. I talked about yin and yang and said that yin relates to things that are more solid. So the, the, the organs that are considered yin in the body. Uh, going over to the front moo points on the left side, the location is on the front of the body, on the abdomen usually, although there's some on the chest. And each organ has a moo point, just like a shoe point. And they tend to treat the more hollow organs, which are yang organs, such as the uh, large intestine, the small intestine, the bladder, the stomach, all organs that are more hollow, we tend to use the moo points for. Also, what's good about moo points, you can use them for diagnostic purposes by uh, you know, pressing onto where the moo point is, or we do something called an O-ring test um, where we could test the strength of the organ um, you know, with the patient. But that's a, that's a whole other process. It's more, uh, it would be better for me to demonstrate that uh, you know, visually to um, understand that. But basically, um, you can use the moo points for diagnostics to figure out what organ is out of balance. Because that's basically what we're doing is manipulating chi as acupuncturist and balancing the body, harmonizing the yin and yang. We look for patterns when we're treating as acupuncturists. We don't say, you have a headache, I'm gonna do this, or you have a, your knee hurts, we're gonna do this, or you have, um, you know, uh, palpitation, uh, uh, yeah, palpitations, and we're going to do this, or, you know, a digestive disorder, we're going to do this, but we look for a pattern that's going on in the body. Sometimes there's an excess, there's too much of something, so we want to figure out how can we treat, treat you and get rid of this excess. That excess could be too much heat, could be a blockage, we use the word stagnation a lot, and stagnation means that the channels blocked. We talked about the meridians and channels. If there's a blockage from scar tissue or from stress, uh, you know, maybe too much phlegm in the body, we would want to reduce that stagnation, disperse it so that she can flow better and you can feel better. There also could be mucus. Mucus 
is considered an excess pattern and we want to resolve and reduce that. On the other hand, we have deficiency. I know sometimes <laughs> you're just having a day maybe in the late afternoon or you just can't get yourself going. And I put this picture here because it just reminded me of just a, a deflated balloon. And it is, the balloon is just either being collapsed or it just can't get up in the air. And uh, I just look at that and I think of deficiency. Uh, you could have chi deficiency, which is a lack of energy, you know, be very tired, um, you, you know, there could be a weakness in the digestion, it could be blood deficient, which with blood deficient, usually there's some trauma involved with this lot of blood loss, or it could be, um, you could be anemic. Um, but when we say blood deficiency, I don't necessarily mean not enough blood, although with blood loss, that would be the case, but it could be the quality of the blood, like with anemia. Also, many times when women give birth, they lose significant amount of blood and they can become uh, temporarily blood deficient. And we want to treat by basically tonifying, building up that blood or that chi. Okay, Wei Chi. I want to talk about Wei Chi a little bit because this is our defensive chi. It what it's what protects us from the pathogens that are external, what's trying to make us sick. Okay. Could be cold, could be flu, uh, you know, uh, things that are coming in that can make us ill. And um, you could say it's our immunity in Western terms, and it's found below the surface of the skin. And um, I'm calling this picture Princess Wei Chi, and she's there to, uh, you know, box out the enemy, which is the Chi coming in, I mean, excuse me, the uh, pathogen that's coming in. And that's basically how it works. Like if you feel someone's pulse, uh, as an acupuncturist, when I feel someone's pulse that, you know, the person might be catching a cold or in the beginning of a cold or an illness, usually the pulse is very superficial and it means that it tells us that the way she is fighting off that pathogen, that uh, potential illness, okay? So um, the takeaway is it's, it's our immunity, way she. And you could be deficient in way she too and be prone to illness. Wind, it's been very windy lately. But in Chinese medicine terms and with acupuncture, we think of wind as an external pathogen. I just talked of external pathogens. And wind is the mother of all evils, meaning it brings in those pathogens. And they usually enter the back of the neck. So on these cold or colder, windy days, damp days, it's a good idea to wear a scarf to protect that area. Now, wind cold and wind heat, um, those are basically terms used for common cold or flu, stomach virus, different things. And I'm going to distinguish between them because when someone comes in and they're like, I'm sick, I usually try to figure out, well, is it more cold affecting them? Cold being a pathogen, an external pathogen, or is heat as an external pathogen affecting them? And I would ask questions to see if there were chills, if there were it was clear mucus or body aches, lean towards a wind cold, and I would treat to more, you know, appropriately, you know, with warming techniques, if, or even promote sweat, but that's a whole other thing. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of thinking out loud now. Um, or wind heat where there can be fever, sore throat, or yellow mucus. So if someone comes in and has a cold, an, acupuncture for, an acupuncturist would first determine what the external pathogen is, is it? and usually the basics are, is it wind cold or wind heat? The hara is our center. And I learned of this term first as a young uh, martial artist in jujitsu, hara is a Japanese term for the uh, center of the abdomen in uh, Qigong, Chinese call it Dantian, and it can be used for diagnostic purposes. Uh, going back to the mood points, the mood points are found mostly on the abs and the front of the body, and we can use um, what we call Hara diagnostics in order to figure out what's going on with a person and treat them correctly. Shen is one of my favorite Chinese medicine terms the mind spirit and shows our vitality. 
And when I say mind and spirit, I don't mean mind um, like the brain, you know, as far as thinking so much, although it can be related, but more the spirit of the body. Um, and usually you see Shen written as or defined as mind slash spirit. And it does indicate mental and emotional health, and it's reflected in the eyes. And I want to read this uh, blurb here. Good Shen is seen as contentment and light in one's eyes, while lackluster eyes indicate poor Shen or even disturbed mind. So it's always nice to have good Shen. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Um, and unfortunately, many people who are mentally ill, you would say their Shen is uh, poor. Five elements, that's a whole other system of Chinese medicine and acupuncture. We look at the body um, using elements. Uh, in astrology, there are four elements. Uh, what is it? Uh, earth, air, fire, and water are in, used in astrology. But in Chinese medicine and acupuncture, we have five elements, water, wood, fire, earth, and metal. And they promote each other, they work with each other, they generate each other. And the basic cycle, there are different cycles with the elements, but the basic one is that water will promote wood, meaning water nurtures or nourishes wood to grow, like as a tree, you put water in a plant so it will grow, or a tree, the wood. Wood promotes fire when you want a fire to increase in heat or size, you would throw logs of wood on. Fire will promote earth, earth promotes metal, and metal promotes water, and then so forth and so on. So we look for imbalances more so in the elements when treating, but that's a whole other system of acupuncture. And uh, usually people go to a specialized school, like a five element acupuncture school to learn this um, you know, more thoroughly. There's another system, which is the auricular system of acupuncture, pertains to the ear. And we look at the ear as a microsystem of the body, just as the feet are used to represent the whole body in reflexology. So when we look at the ear, um, you kind of have to use your imagination a little bit, but try to visualize the lobe as being the head of a fetus or a baby, and you know the, the fetus is curled up, so th the spine would be, it's kind of hard for me to point out, I don't think I could do that. Oh, I can point here. So you have the lobe here, the spine, oops, oh, come back. The spine would be um, in this area here, the internal organs are found in this internal area. So it kind of makes sense. The legs up in this area, arms, and that keeps doing that. Um, so I guess the point I'm trying to make is the body is represented within the ears. And we can treat using the ear. And this is in particularly, uh, it's particularly uh, good when we're doing community acupuncture, where we could treat many people in a room without having to put everybody on a table, okay? So we can access the ears easily. And if somebody has, let's say, you know, lower back pain, we can find the point, the area on the ear for the lower back and do acupuncture there. And people find it effective. Moxibustion is another tool of the trade. Uh, the herb that's used is mugwort and it's dried. And made it to, uh, I don't have a picture here, but it's usually made into a wool and you can make it into cones and different things. And it's used for warming, tonifying, building the area and reducing inflammation. Now, if you look at this picture, this is actually a smokeless moxa stick. And it's smokeless because moxa does create a lot of smoke and a lot of times in offices, we don't want that presence of smoke but the slight amount of smoke usually is fine and um, we light, we actually do light the moxa, so it is a burning technique. We do light the moxa stick or the cone in order to warm and tonify the body. So especially this time of year and as it gets colder, uh, acupuncturists will be using moxa more and more often. And last but not least, 
cupping. Many of you have heard of cupping. It's used to enhance a treatment as an adjunct to uh, acupuncture or it could be used on its own. Uh, many celebrities have uh, used acupuncture, excuse me, um, cupping in order to move chi and blood, uh, reduce pain, or even to loosen phlegm in the chest. You can put these points on those back shoe points I had mentioned along the back in order to uh, either relieve discomfort in the back or to loosen phlegm in the chest. And I believe that, yes, this is all xie xie. That's uh, thank you in Chinese. And I appreciate you stopping by to this webinar. And I hope you learned a bit about acupuncture in some different terms. Uh, you can visit us at innersourcehealth.com for more information. We have several naturopathic doctors and other acupuncturists that work there that uh, you can learn from. And please stop by my Facebook Inner Source Eastern Medicine page and like it. I would appreciate that. I'd have more information on events on that page. Or more information to make an appointment. Or if you have questions about acupuncture, you are invited to sign up for a free uh, phone call to learn more about how acupuncture can be of help to you. Thank you, and if we have some questions, um, we might have a little bit of time. I'm not sure, I lost track of the time here. Yeah, we've got a, a couple minutes. Yeah, I've got a couple questions here that did come in. Thank you so much, Dr. Leota, that was, that was really insightful. Um, so the first question that came in, does cupping always cause marks? And if so, how long do they last? I guess people saw like the Olympic swimmers with the cups all over them, so. Uh, just oh, that a little bit. Sure, sure. Uh, yes and no. Sometimes you can get marks from cupping. I've seen patients that that don't, and they've had uh, good results. Uh, the, the marks, yes, they could be. <laughs> You know, it depends. Sometimes they're 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 darker uh, when there's more stagnation in the body. And it comes to the surface. There might be a darker mark, and the marks usually take a few days to about a week to uh, you know fade. But they do do go away. But I always ask people um, before, and I explain things about the uh, marks before uh, doing cupping on someone in case they have an event they have to go to where they're wearing you know a gown where they don't want the cup marks to show, or they're you know in the summertime especially. With the beach, yes, they, there will be marks uh, for the most part, but they will fade. It's safe. Okay. Um, the other question was whether acupuncture is safe for people on blood thinners. Absolutely. It's always good to let your acupuncturist know all your medications or any changes in medications. But yes, um, I treat people with uh, blood thinners and it is uh, that are on blood thinners and it is safe. Um, might be a small amount of bruising, but people on blood thinners are prone to that anyway. So, uh, you know, it's uh, a good question though. Very good question, but yes, it is safe. Great. And the last question is, let me just pull it up. Um, can acupuncture help with allergies in particular? Yes. Um, going back to the weight sheet, when there's um, a deficiency in Wei Qi, we usually develop allergies. Um, that's how we see it in Chinese medicine and acupuncture. So by using points on the body that um, you know, promote better lung function, stronger lung function, and also stronger Wei Qi, uh, we can help with allergies and people do uh, see results. Great. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Leota, and thank you for everyone joining. Um, we'll certainly be sending out more information on future webinars. I'm sure Dr. Dr. Leota will do many more. Um, so thanks again. And um, that actually wraps up with perfect timing. So uh, we'll be signing off here from InterSource Health. Thank you.